Welcome to the Endurance Drive podcast. Our mission is to share the key principles that structure our approach to endurance training and coaching. I'm Jim. And I'm Katie. And Jim, we're starting with our segment, How Is Your Recovery Going? <laughs> well, thanks for asking. I appreciate you asking you know, other folks uh, checking in, but it's going well. Um, yeah, it's a little bit humbling, I think, is probably the word this week. Uh, relearning how to engage my quad and my glute max. And yeah, I do, we take all this stuff for granted, right? And all the small movements that we make every day and all the movement that we do, do in general as athletes. And now I'm just having to actually relearn how to walk. So that brings me to my first point, which is shout out to Neil, our PT extraordinaire, who's been fitting me in. And just that that point of like always having a professional network to support your athletic and uh, injury <laughs> adventure, shall we say. Yeah, Neil is the best. And if you haven't heard his podcast interview, we actually interviewed him a few months ago about injuries. And he talked about acute traumatic injuries. So you can learn about what that means, or you can just ask Jim at this point. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, I'm sure it's a lot. And I think as people who love to move our bodies and do really hard things, to come back to this point where we need to learn how to do those easy things again, I'm sure is very, very humbling. And really want to commend like you keep bringing this positive attitude to it. And I'm sure that that's really hard a lot of the time. So shout out to you for that. And I think also want to shout out, it does feel like there's been a little bit of an epidemic of bike crashes happening and just other uncontrollables. And even just the last week, um, I was out at the New England season opener over the weekend and it was a really, really wet roads. That's just a sprint distance race. I was spectating, supporting some of our athletes there. And there were a lot of bike crashes on the course. It's a course that has downhills and sharp turns, and there it was just carnage all over the all over the course, including some of our athletes. I had another athlete have a pretty bad crash um, in Long Island over the weekend, and it's scary. And so I think we just want to say, like, if you're going through this stuff, you're not alone. There's breaks happening, there's road rash happening, and we can take all the precautions in the world, and there's still going to be some risk with riding our TT bikes. So just putting that out there. Yeah, I think we talked about it last time, which is, you know, race sims, lots of things can go wrong and that's and that's okay. And also with sort of first races, it seemed like we, hopefully we got out all the crashes and all, and all the, again, sort of quote adventures in the first races of, of the season. But it was a very eventful weekend, wasn't it? Yeah, it definitely was. Although this actually does bring me to one interesting insight that I got from one of my athletes who was in a pretty tough bike crash over the weekend and she's doing okay, ultimately just ended up with a lot of road rash and luckily no brakes. But something that she noticed in the first couple of days was, you know, she felt pretty awful the first day or two, but she had gone into that ride feeling pretty beat up from just a lot of high volume. She's getting ready for an Ironman. And then once she was forced to take this break and just let all the road rash heal, she said that she actually had a huge increase in her HRV, decrease in resting heart rate, and a big boost in sleep, which is surprising because, you know, she was in a pretty scary crash, but it was kind of this more superficial type injuries on the outside. So I think a silver lining for her was, you know, maybe sometimes these things feel awful and like a big setback. And I think in your case, Jim, I mean, this is probably a much bigger setback than you wanted or needed in terms of the recovery timeline. But sometimes when something happens mid-season that takes you out for a week or two weeks, seeing this with athletes getting sick, it forces you to take a recovery that you might not have taken otherwise. And sometimes that can be kind of helpful for long-term just stability and longevity in the sport. Right. Yeah. We never want to see anybody get hurt to take a week off or get sick. But yeah, there's, I mean, there's so many stories of like, uh, this person was sick for a week before the Olympics and then they won the gold. And it's like, mm -hmm. oh yeah, because we're always, we drive so much chronic and acute fatigue as athletes and we just sort of get so good at ignoring it and not feeling it. And then when, yeah, we get these sort of forced breaks, if you will, boy, you really come back stronger. So yeah, again, sort of shout out to everybody who's out there nursing their road rash and whatever injuries they have. And sorry to say it's a, a little bit of a break, but often it's beneficial too. Totally. Well, with that in mind, we're glad that your mindset is continuing to be okay. Um, let's transition into the rest of our coaching and training insights. So what else have you picked up in the last couple of weeks? So this is kind of interesting here. So we talked about this, you know, keep the recreation and recreational athletes and keeping play. And so I read something that really resonated with me this week, which was, um, and I'll quote here, engaging in playful activities during exercise rather than repetitive tasks like running on a treadmill. <laughs> activates different brain networks, enhancing cognitive functions such as mental flexibility. Uh, this approach to exercise trains the brain in a dynamic and enjoyable way. So I think it's just a fancy way of saying like, do something fun while you're out there. And it's sort of some examples that I, I want to give here is um, to say you're out on your runs, you know, doing pickups, for example, like, you know, pick a tree or a driveway or a pole, run to a road, run real fast. Just keep the pickups, you know, fun and dynamic, or maybe take one of your runs and, you know, go to the trails and bound up the trails or work on fast feet going downhill, but really just sort of get creative and particularly if also if you can do it with a friend, like it's really fun to go out 
biking with friends and maybe do a challenge to a town line sprint or you play chase where you say, okay, I'll give you five seconds and you go hard, then I'll try to catch you. But again, it's always sort of keeping it sort of playful. And another thing, fun thing to do is if you're in the pool with people, like if you're swimming with people who are at different um, paces, you know, you can say, okay, we're doing your 50s. Maybe you do 50s in the 45 seconds. I do them on the 40. So you give that person a five second head start and you say, don't let me catch you. And you guys just race all the time. But the point is being like, there's lots of ways to be creative and to be playful. And it just turns out that when you are playful in your recreation, um, it really benefits your brain. I love that insight so much. And it actually reminds me a little bit of even just Strava segments. That's a great way to insert play into what you're doing. I had a ride over the weekend with our friend Justine, who was on the podcast a couple of weeks ago, and there was a Strava segment. So for those who aren't familiar who don't use Strava, Strava has all these different areas where someone has decided that this road to this road is some special segment. And so you can go as hard as you can. And then if you're the fastest one, you can win a trophy or a crown. And Justine said, like, hey, I need you to help me try and get this segment. So I was going to lead her out. I was going to be her domestique <laughs> to get this segment. And I think I set my best one minute power either for life or for the year, just trying to like smash this thing and not let Justine down. And it was a total blast. And I otherwise would not have decided to go as hard as I possibly could for one minute on my otherwise easy four hour long ride. So yeah, super, super uh fun. That's yeah, that's that's just fantastic. It's so much fun. And then you just feel like you just overwhelming joy when you get mm -hmm. you, you do these things and everybody's laughing and smiling and giggling and you're like, okay, that's it. And it always feels good. I've always wondered like, why does this feel so good? And I realized, oh, it's just it's good for the brain. So yeah, that's just super fun. And uh I think my last point here is that we've got people putting their wetsuits on now. And so I'm gonna put a link in the show notes, which is on our website, for a couple of videos on how to put on your wetsuit. Cause really like if your wetsuit is tight, it's probably just the way you're putting it on. Um, maybe you bought the wrong size, but most people get the right size. But there's a real couple of keys to putting on your wetsuit. And uh, again, we'll, we'll link a couple of videos uh, in the show notes and you can watch those. And, and then your wetsuit should go around really easily and then should fit pretty well on your on your shoulders as well. Totally. And an aside on that is I actually had an athlete recently who was pretty sure that she'd bought the wrong size of wetsuit. She's like, I can't get it on. And I was like, have you tried any type of lubricant tri-slide? Tri-slide is the product that I like for this. And she put some tri-slide on and she got it completely on. Sometimes note that you also might even need someone to help you a little bit. So it's fun right before a race to be with all your friends and everyone's zipping up each other's wetsuits. But just keep in mind, like it is tight. It is tighter than your jeans. It's tighter than your shirt, but it is tight because you don't want there to be a lot of extra water in there. So grab some tri-slide if you're having any issues getting it on. The other thing too is that your wetsuit is a little bit like a sponge and it will open up over time. So yeah, when you first put on a new wetsuit and you go for your first open water swim, yeah, your arms and your shoulders probably are going to not feel good and that's just normal. But if you swim in your wetsuit and put it on properly and swim in your wetsuit maybe two, three, four times, it should feel pretty comfortable at that point. Definitely good tips on that wetsuit. So check out our online show notes for those videos. Katie, what do you got for insights this week? Yeah, I have a lot of insights. I feel like a lot came to mind, so I will try to get them through them pretty quickly. But the first one I'm calling, it is so great to be a triathlete. So why is it so great to be a triathlete? Well, I had a bit of a calf niggle come on after a long tempo run recently, and it wasn't too bad. It was probably like a three out of 10 on a pain scale. But I was like, mm, this is the type of thing where I could go do a bunch of hard running and really mess up my calf, or I could dial it back, take a couple days of just a little bit more chill. But the great thing about being a triathlete is that I was having zero pain during any type of biking or swimming. And so instead of feeling like, oh, there's this catastrophic thing happening, my running is all messed up, it was awesome to actually just shift the focus of my training week and say, oh, great, I'm going to do some really quality workouts on the bike and on my swimming. And I felt like I didn't even skip a beat with my fitness building because we work on all of these three domains. So I think a lot of the time we hear runners like lament how terrible it is, like, oh, I have to go out and cross train. But as triathletes, we're just training for our sport and we're shuffling things around. So I think this is a great shout out to just being a triathlete in general and knowing that if something comes on with one sport, it doesn't always mean you have to shut everything down. Again, that it depends on the energy and what's going on. But in general, a little bit of creativity can be really helpful with avoiding something going into a full-blown injury and not really um, missing anything from a training perspective. Yeah, that's great. And I always tell people, like, first of all, like triathlon is kind of crazy because it takes a lifetime to master one sport. And here we are trying to master three sports. So if they say, you know, 10,000 hours to master one thing, it's like, hey, well, where's my 30,000 hours to master triathlon? <laughs> <laughs> so it's a big ask. And also I tell athletes all the time, like, you know, as coaches, we have our fingers sort of on the dials, right? So if something does come up, you get a niggle, we can turn the running knob down, but we can turn the swim and the bike thing up. And sometimes that just, again, you, you sort of come out either the same or ahead because maybe bike was a weakness 
for that person and you do mm-hmm. dial the run down a little bit and then suddenly we do a little bike block for maybe a few days or maybe a week or two and you're just better at biking now. So yeah, shout out to triathletes. <laughs> Definitely. All right. So next insight here, I love sometimes pulling in some data to shape an insight. And I thought this one was really interesting because it relates to a question that we get a lot as coaches, which is, is it really worth it for me to get a TT bike if I'm on a road bike? And so I did some data comparisons recently. Um, I recently took my TT bike outside. I've been doing most of my riding outside because I'm within this specific prep phase. But previously, I was really enjoying just being on my road bike. So my standard bike loop that I always do all the time is about 28 miles. It's a pretty flat loop. And I went in, I compared my ride with a road bike, just a loop like that, to the exact same ride with a TT bike at what happened to be two rides with the exact same normalized power. So I looked at this first ride, road bike, second ride, TT bike, 173 normalized power, which is like a zone two ride for me. What was really interesting was to see that on the road bike, my average speed was 17.3 miles per hour on the road bike and 19.1 miles per hour on the TT bike for the exact same normalized power. My heart rate was a couple beats higher on the TT bike. That's something that I see fairly often, but also, you know, there's a lot of things that impact heart rate. I don't know what the wind was or the heat was on these different days. But in general, I think it's just pretty meaningful to see that we were almost two miles per hour faster on the TT bike versus the road bike for the exact same normalized power. So TT bikes aren't free, but they are free speed in the sense that you don't need any additional fitness to be a lot faster. And I would say on a flat course, it makes a really, really big difference. So if you're doing your first race, get a road bike, it'll be totally fine. You'll have a great day. But if you really want to take your triathlon prep to the next level, I do think a TT bike is a pretty worthwhile investment. Yeah, I love this. I mean, data is I think, the love language of most triathletes. So when I, when I saw this comment in, in this notes, I'm like, this is the best ever. <laughs> so, but no, it's such a great, it's such a, I'm so glad you did this. And this is such a great example of exactly, we always tell people like, you're probably going to gain two miles to three miles an hour just to free speed by being on a TT bike. Just, you know, mostly it's just reducing your frontal drag. That's really what a TT bike does. And so I just, I love this example because it's just, it's so solid. So I think we're going to use this example over and over again for athletes. And I know certainly I'll use this example to athletes. Say This is a real case study that was done. And here it is. Mm-hmm. We should publish this. Do you want to write a paper? Maybe we should write it. We should probably do like one of those, you know, science journal kind of things, right? It would probably things. get accepted in the journal science is the best journal out there. So. Or probably, or probably nature. I'm sure nature is going to be. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I do. I do have a PhD, so I'm just putting yeah, it right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, another point that I wanted to make on the power of comparing the same workout two x. So in my runs, I've been doing a lot of tempo running recently. And I had another comparison where two weeks back to back, I did a very similar tempo run on a cooler day versus a hotter day. So we've been starting to have the first really, really hot days of the season. And it was meaningful to see that, wow, heart rate is going to be really, really different. And this isn't something that should be super, super surprising. But I think this was a nice reminder for me that when it's super humid or it's super hot, you're going to need to dial down your pace or power to keep your heart rate in the same place. And that doesn't mean you have less fitness. It doesn't mean anything other than the fact that your body's working a lot, lot harder to stay cool when it's that warm out. So as you do it more, you're going to acclimate, but just don't try to hold those exact same paces on a 50 degree day versus a 90 degree day because it's like training on a completely different planet. And you can dig yourself into a pretty big hole if you try to only focus on pace and power. Yeah, this is a great point because we're recording this in, in late May. And uh, as most people know, we're, we're New England based athletes. And so this is this funny thing where probably 90% of most people's training at this point has been done about around 45 degrees. But now we're starting to see these hot days and the first races of the year. And uh, I've got an athlete doing a marathon this weekend and she loves the winter and loves running in the cold. And it turns out that, you know, it's going to be 70 to 80 degrees for her marathon with, you know, 80% humidity. So it's going to be a hot race. We're talking about, you know, sort of, again, looking at heart rate, looking at pace, being conservative in the first half, managing her thermoregulation. And I think these early season races are actually some of the hardest races that we face because of that awkward transition, because we're just not heat adapted yet. Totally agree. And I would say actually things like a sauna protocol can be valuable here. So if you really feel like you're not going to be able to do a ton of training, but you know that there's a chance that your race could be hot, do things like that fan off trainer session, do things like getting in the sauna for a couple minutes um, or even up to 30 minutes, usually for several days leading up to your A race. That can sometimes be helpful, but you have to manage your expectations and you have to manage heart rate, I think, is the upshot of all of that. Yeah. So very last insight for me, we're staying on this comparison theme. And I want to talk a little bit about training peaks metrics. If this is new to you, you can go back into our good data and bad data episode and we talk about things like CTL, chronic training load or fitness metrics. 
And I was looking at my training peaks and I was like, hmm, CTL this season is a little bit different from around this time last season as I was training for Ironman like Placid. I was trying to think a little bit more about this because I actually do feel about as fit as I did last year. Like my times have been good and I feel really strong. And then I remembered that, okay, CTL isn't everything. Training Peaks doesn't capture everything. And something that's been really different for me this season is putting a huge focus on really good strength training. I've talked about this many times on the podcast before. And at the end of the day, Training Peaks CTL does not capture changes in literally building muscle, for example. You know, you can get some heart rate TSS from your strength workouts, but there is no way to capture that. And on that point, Training Peaks also doesn't capture things like better fueling, better sleep. It really is weighted towards that high, high, high volume. And so I think it's just all about keeping in perspective. Like that is one data metric, but it's not the only metric. And I think we could think about, for example, even like Coach Kevin trained really hard for a marathon this year. And in Training Peaks, his CTL was probably a lot lower than it was when he was getting ready for Ironman like Placid, but he was running a much faster marathon than he would have at that same time because of that volume focus. So again, as coaches, it's our job to keep an eye on CTL. You as an athlete don't even really have to worry about it that much, but it was just a nice reminder for me that one data point is never everything. You have to be really holistic about thinking about fitness and knowing that at the end of the day, fitness is sort of a feeling. And so if you're feeling it, like thumbs up, you're in the right place. Yeah, that's a great point. I think CTL and, and training peaks and all these data, you know, data metrics we get from our garments, it makes us feel like we're in control, right? We really know something about our body and about what we're really doing. But when you really step back, it's exactly what you say is there's just so many variables and the humans are so complex and there's just so much we don't even know about the human body. Like we don't even know like, you know, how to cure the common cold yet, right? So how is it, how are we supposed to know that there's a number that reflects our actual overall fitness? We actually don't. It's this absolute illusion of control. And like you say, it is a useful tool and it does tell us something about overall load in terms of managing all these crazy sports that we're doing. But you were right, at the end of the day, like there's so much more than what can be captured in Training Peaks or Data or Garmin or any of these other, you know, whoop or whatever we're using. Exactly. And I would say if you're not worried about CTL and TSS, don't start worrying about it now. This really just goes out to people that are the data geeks in our group. But if you've never looked at that number, like just don't even start. We'll worry about it. Right. Just, just fast forward over this section. Like we never talked about it at all, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay. Well, that's our insights. And I think we actually made it to this point without even introducing the topic of the episode. So a little bit of a cliffhanger, but this is a fun one. And we are going to talk about the top mistakes that we think triathletes tend to make. And I want to preview this by saying we're not trying to be preachy at all. We are saying these mistakes because we have made most of these at some point in our triathlon journeys. We've been doing this for a long enough time that hopefully we can at least share what we've learned so that you don't make those same mistakes. But I think we'll just kind of jump right in, fire off a bunch of these mistakes, and then you can not make them and kind of skip a lot of years of trial and tribulation getting to your peak form. Yeah. And if I can say here, I think I have literally made every mistake in the book with training. So I look, as we go through these, I'm like, yeah, I did that. Yep. Did that. Did that. And we could probably list another couple hundred more that I also did as well. So <laughs> that's part of what I love about coaching is that we sort of yeah, sort of shortcut the system and say, okay, hey, listen, like you said, we've done this before. We've made some of these mistakes. And they like can say, we're not preaching. We're just trying to point out that most of our athletes who we're coaching aren't having to learn these lessons because we're coaching them. But this is sort of mostly, I think, sort of aimed at folks maybe who are listening to our podcast who maybe don't have a coach or are just starting their triathlon journey. So hopefully we can save you some time and some headache. Well, with that, I think the very first one, and this takes us back to one of our most popular episodes ever, which is all about zone two. So we see a huge mistake in that a lot of people ignore the concept of zone two entirely. They ignore things like 80-20. And often we see this manifests as just too much of that gray zone, zone three training, too much intensity is pretty common or occasionally not enough intensity. If you're just out there, you know, taking walks and hoping that that will get you to your A race, that's something that we see really commonly. Yeah. I mean, I think we've said so much about zone two in, in, all, in all of our episodes. Um, but right. Yeah. So just a, in a real quick recap is that, you know, zone, zone one, zone two really builds the mitochondria. And the mitochondria in a very simple way is our fuel tank and our fuel and then also the sponge to help absorb these byproducts from energy production. And so you just the game is to build as much mitochondria as possible. And zone one, zone two are the best way to build that. And then the upper zones, uh, zone three, zone four, zone five, they help improve the function of the mitochondria. So there's it's a big tent. We we have room for all zones, not just a zone two coaches. 
But there is a time and place, and like Katie said, that about 80% of the time, it's uh, zone one, zone two, building up the mitochondria, and then the other 20% is really helping improve the function of the mitochondria. Definitely. And if you want a deeper dive, just jump into that episode too. You can learn all about how zone two works. But something I do want to reiterate from that episode is that even if, let's say, you're training for a 5K, 80-20 and zone two is still really powerful. I think there's some cool studies that look at the volume of, for example, like Olympic speed skaters whose events are like a minute long or something. And even so, they are doing massive amounts of that zone two volume. So don't think this is only for our Ironman audience. This is really for everyone. Everyone should be doing some level of 80-20. Yeah, a good question. So I have people ask me all the time, like, hey, I'm a really time crunched athlete. I've only got, you know, four to five hours a week. So I don't have to do zone two. And it's like, no, actually you're the perfect example has to do zone two because you have such a limited time and your time should be spent really most of it just in building that aerobic and, and metabolic foundation. And, um, you know, most of us can find more than four or five hours. But again, if you're a time crunch athlete, don't think, oh, I'm going to go to high intensity hit workouts and that's going to be my answer. Yeah, it's going to make you feel good and you get some of your yayas out. And there's a time and place for all that. But it's just in terms of like reaching your potential, reaching your athletic potential, like you still need to go to the 80-20 regardless of how many hours that you're doing in a week. 100%. Okay, that's zone two. Next mistake that we see triathletes making is, we're gonna call it putting too much weight on the outputs and not enough weight on the inputs. So the outputs of training are exactly what it sounds like. It is training, it is swimming and biking and running and lifting weights and all the other things that you do. The inputs are all the things that actually make that possible. So sleep, nutrition, recovery, even things like functional or safe gear. And I think the biggest one to pull out here is we definitely see people who are not fueling their fitness during training and especially during racing, as well as people who are just not sleeping enough, way too much life stress. I think that's really, really common when we're encountering new triathletes. Yeah. Again, we go back to that article, data, bad data. We have all this data being shoved at us, but at the end of the day, it's not really about the data. And actually that kind of leads to our third insight, which is some people, I would say, use way too much data and some people end up using way too little data. So we can talk a little bit about that because I think it's related to these questions about fueling and sleep and recovering. But when we use too much data, we see people who really lose the ability to listen to their body. So it's like, OK, like I've got it. My Garmin says that I'm in prime mode and I'm ready to do this, even though my leg really hurts and I don't feel exactly right. That's often what can lead to these injuries and stuff. But at the same time, if you're like, I'm never going to use my watch, I'm never going to look at heart rate, often that can also manifest as overtraining unless you know your body really, really well, because without having some type of heart rate cap or paying attention to those things, I think we find that people all just end up in that gray zone. Right. How about strength training? Do people ignore it or do people do too much strength training or too little strength training? What do you think? (laughs) I think, I mean, in the world, there are plenty of people who do too much strength training, but in our community, it's definitely too little strength training, which is a really big mistake we see triathletes make. And this was like me until probably this year. So I'm just going to put it out there. Like, yes, you can get some level of result, but you are going to be way less durable, way more susceptible to injury, I would say. And you're also just not going to exercise your true potential. Like building muscle is a way to get faster at swimming and biking and running. And I think a lot of endurance athletes are like, oh, well, it's going to make me bulky. It's, it's actually not. It's going to just improve the function of your muscles And unless you're following a specific bulking program, which is pretty hard to do, like you've got to really commit to it. If you want to get really, really powerlifting type bulking, that's not what's going to happen. You're just going to get faster at your sports. Yeah, I've never met an endurance athlete who's actually bulked up from strength training. It's a total myth. And I think we do get this. I mean, I've suffered from this too, like this illusion of like, I am super fit. Look at, and then get back to our CTL. Look at my CTL. I'm so fit. The training piece says I'm so fit. But I remember a few years ago, I went to the gym and I I started lifting and I looked in the mirror the first day and I thought, who's the skinny guy who looks kind of fit, but he doesn't really have any muscle mass. And I was like, okay, this is this has to be rectified. So yeah, it's easy to get caught up. In, I mean, again, we're managing three sports and it's really a lot and it's hard, it's hard to add a four sport swing training. But yeah, for most of our athletes, swing training obviously is, is super important, especially for our master athletes. You know, some of our younger athletes, they tend to be overpowered and uh, strength is not exactly their limiter. Their limiter generally is building up this aerobic and metabolic foundation. But, you know, we start getting a little bit older and especially my master athletes, you, you absolutely have to earn your endurance. You have to start with strength training first and then you can move to endurance training. Mm -hmm. I think we know that actually after your like 30s or 40s, you start to lose bone density and muscle mass, like pretty precipitously just drops off as you age. So you have to fight so hard against that with the strength training. And I think it's valuable to start that practice. Like I'm in my 20s right now, so maybe I'm still kind of in a good spot for those type of metrics. But if you start a practice now, 
you're going to have a bigger base to start from. And so I think now is the time for pretty much everyone. But I would say to your point on not overdoing it on strength, we usually find that maybe two or three sessions in the gym is perfect for most endurance athletes. It doesn't need to be long and it doesn't need to be all the time. Just go and lift heavy weights and be there for, say, 45 minutes. And you can probably get a lot of benefit from that. I think the next one here is is ignore technique and skill development. And I think this is particularly true with swimming, which is really a technique sport, but it's also related to biking as well and uh, being on your TT bike. And actually, I think as well, I think running is a very highly skilled. I think running and swimming is actually um, very similar. There's a lot of skill to both of those sports. And um, so again, a, a focus, we, we do a lot of focus here on, on swim drills or swimming well and run drills at the endurance drive. So just don't overlook um, skill drill development. Mm-hmm. I think that until you're a really, really good swimmer, it is so much more valuable to go to the pool and do Technique 50s for a full season of Technique 50s than saying, I'm going to smash like really hard swimming with bad form. That's not really going to help anyone. So I completely agree that technique is huge. And I think just like to your point on TT biking, for example, a lot of people say, well, I'm more comfortable on the trainer and I know that I can hit my watts on the trainer. Well, your race is not on the trainer. And so I'd rather you go under and spend a lot of time outside just being comfortable taking your water bottle out than spending a ton of time saying like, well, I can do sweet spot if I'm inside. There's a time and a place for both, but definitely don't overlook that skill development. Yeah, and to your point about the swim, I think but one winter we you know you and I both did a ton of fifties, just drill, 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 and it just turned out that sort of fitness follows along behind that. So we were just focusing on technique for so long and just doing fifties, and you think, oh, they're not getting fit, but you totally are getting swim fit. And I always tell people, and I was like, you can do swim fifties for probably a couple months at, at a time and just focus on that, and then you can scale it up to swimming a thousand, you know, twelve hundred. You don't have to like you know swim hundreds and then one fifties. And it's not this linear progression; it's sort of this exponential thing. So once you lock in the ability to repeat a good swim stroke over and over again, you can scale it up to really to any distance. So I don't know, maybe the fifties are kind of like these exercise snacks, right? They're just they're very small. They don't seem like they're doing much, but they're super powerful uh, if you stack them all up over time. Yep. Shout out to the fifties. And related to this, I think we see that triathletes often don't actually swim enough to make the swim a non-event. And we usually say like in an Ironman, in a half Ironman, you should try to make the swim a non-event so that you can give it your all on the bike and the run. But as you know, the weather gets warmer, as you can get in the open water, make sure you're getting out for some of those long swims and replicating your race distance, because I think that's something where we do see people falling short a little bit in, in terms of preparation. Yeah. And also too, along that point, if you can do, uh, you know, we do a lot of bricks bike to run and that's sort of the focus. Like, what are you doing for your brick workout? But I actually think my hot take is that the more important transition is the swim to bike. And so if you can, you know, go out to the local lake and have your bike and can safely leave it out there for a while and then go swim your distance or go swim more than your brace distance and then jump on your bike and see how that feels. And I always feel like I get caught off guard Every time I do a triathlon, I jump back on the bike and I go, oh my God, my heart rate's up, my power is down. And it's like, yeah, because I haven't practiced coming from swimming, probably swimming pretty hard or even just easy. And then jumping on the bike and being like, wow, what a difference. It's so much harder for me to go from swim to bike than it is to go from bike to run. I don't know if you feel the same way. I absolutely do. And I think a lot of the time people might not end up doing that transition early in the season because if they're doing a long ride, for example, on a Saturday, sometimes there's not good pool hours on a Saturday morning or you're like, oh, like I can't figure out how to make all this work. And so sometimes that gets pushed to the side. And then before you know it, you only have your week four race in and you're like, okay, I guess is my single swim before the bike. But I would say even just getting in the water for one to 2K before the bike, just to get that transition, the like I am going horizontal and now I'm vertical. And I'm already kind of working my metabolic system. I already need to start fueling, I think is really, really valuable. So you can throw that in kind of whenever on a weekend long ride. And we have a ton of athletes who are in the Boston area. I would say check out Walden Pond. If you're in the Upper Valley, check out Post Pond. We can link some of these places to go to. And if you have found other places that work really well for a swim to bike transition in the broader New England area, we definitely will take them. But I would say this is a huge priority for half Ironman and Ironman athletes. Yeah. And I think this sort of that rolls into your point of getting outside in the heat of the day, right? And so we talked about this before now, we're starting to get into the hot and humid part of the season. And I just think the most common thing I hear from people is they say, oh, this race was so hot today. It was so hot outside. And I was like, no, 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 guys, it's hot every day outside. Just that we're indoor cats, we work inside. And that we set up our training to be really, you know, as perfect as possible. So in no blame to the when you can train, but like a lot of people can have to only can train in the morning, right? So it's going to be cool in the morning. But so if you can arrange maybe say your weekend training 
um, wait for it to warm up a little bit out there. You know, have a have a long breakfast, uh, spend some time with your family, and then go out at say ten o'clock or eleven o'clock when it's starting to get really hot, and because that's those are the conditions that you're going to be in probably on race day. So go out there and look at heart rate and see how it responds when it's now ten or twenty degrees warmer humidity has come up. So yeah, get outside and train in the heat of the day. I think that's a great tip. And I'd also say, you know, related to this, even separate from the heat, it is valuable to make sure you're comfortable exercising at the time that you're going to race. So this is actually a point for runners, but we saw with the Boston Marathon, for example, a lot of people's waves did not start until after 11 o'clock and most of them were comfortable at running at say six in the morning. And so even figuring out things like how is my body going to react at that time? What do I need to eat beforehand to be able to go a little bit later? There's a half marathon that Jim, you and I have both run several times in Hanover called the Chad that always starts at 12 o'clock noon. And I'm always like, what? Like, what do I do about this? Right. How am I going to, when's lunch? When's breakfast? Mm-hmm. So I think in general, like think about timing and be really, really mindful. And it's good that, you know, most Ironmans and half Ironmans do start relatively early, but that does mean you're going to be running in hot weather. So if you just have a run, doing it at noon is not a bad idea. Yeah, fantastic. All right. So I think we have a, a gear part here. I like this. Wow. We do. Yeah. So my mistake that I pulled out here is I think sometimes we see brand new triathletes not investing in just the bare minimum of, of gear that you need to be able to train and compete comfortably and safely. Now, I am not the type of person who thinks you need to break the bank and buy a $10,000 perfect triathlon bike, but you need to have new running shoes that fit you well, ideally from a specialty running store where they can take a look at your gait a bike that is properly fitted to you and you need to service it when needed. You need a good helmet. This is a huge one. One of the bike crashes over the weekend, I really think one of our athletes, like the helmet saved his life. So you really want a good helmet. There's helmets with MIPS. That's a concussion prevention type technology. So recommend that. You do need a Garmin or other type of sport watch. We don't recommend something like an Apple watch because it's going to die sometime in your two hour event or whatever that is. And then a chest heart rate strap, a triathlon specific wetsuit, a comfortable kit and quality nutrition products. There's probably other things that we're forgetting here. And it's important to keep in mind that triathlon is a really expensive sport. But if you're going to try to say like, oh, whatever, I'll grab some random bike that's going to fall apart while I'm out there. I have an old helmet that doesn't matter. This is where we're getting into really sketchy territory. So I would say just make sure that you're hitting this bare minimum. And also... Maybe another related mistake is spending too much money on gimmicky things that don't actually matter. Like at the end of the day, we know that sleep and nutrition are the best things for recovery. You can buy 800 different type of special massage tools and whatever that is. But I would say first, just stick with this really important baseline stuff. And so then you can compete and train um, comfortably and safely. So are you saying a Theragun is not a critical part of triathlon? Well, I was actually thinking about doing a Theragun for my gear pick of the week, but then I was like, I can't do that after saying that some of this stuff is gimmicky. But they do have this new cool attachment that I just got that's heated. So if you want to get yourself a special treat, it's fine. But okay. this is not a, it's not a mistake if you don't do that, is the way I'll say it. Yeah, no, I, th- I like your, your point about, yeah, triathlon is super expensive and there's a barrier to getting into the sport. And so whenever I start working with a new athlete and I send them this long list of, here's the stuff you should get, but I always say, but let's step by step. So you know, talk to your coach or even if you're not being coached by us, feel free to reach out to us and say, hey, can you help me prioritize what I need to get now? Because maybe you do have an older bike that's quite nice and fits you well. And maybe that'll be fine for this season or something. Or maybe you're going to use your Peloton for a couple, you know, for a couple months during the winter time and then get a bike. So there's ways to step through this stuff to sort of make it affordable over time. You don't have to run out and spend everything. But like you say, you do have to have quality gear because it's, it's safety and it really affects the quality of how you actually execute on race day and your training. Agreed. Okay, next mistake that we see, I'm calling this one, in quotes, not seeing the forest for the trees. So what does it actually mean? I think a mistake that we see people making is it's really easy to get caught up in like the minute details of like, oh my gosh, the swim workout says 2,600 yards, but then I did the set and it was only 2,450 yards, stuff like that. And I think that's common because the minute details actually seem a lot more controllable and tractable than these bigger questions of like, can I complete my Ironman? But I would say it is a lot more important to focus on the big picture. So if you're feeling these anxieties kind of come up about these very, very small details, try to just take a little bit of a bird's eye view and zoom out and ask yourself, is this going to materially change the outcome of my race? And if the answer is yes, yeah, you should be thinking about it. But if the answer is no, just try to let that go. It does require a good amount of mindfulness to get there. But I think just to quell some anxiety, maybe early on, be thinking about that. 
Yeah, I think it really comes down to when you start, you do any workout is what is the intent of the workout? And if you don't know what the intent of the workout is, then yeah, reach out to your coach and say, hey, what is the intent? Because we want you to know what the intent is. And once you kind of know what the intent is, then I think it makes it easier to not focus on the data. Because yeah, I mean, we've all done this and I've focused on the same thing. You know, I I have to hit this specific yard to do this specific thing and make my box go green in training peaks. But really when you sort of step back and say, okay, I'm short on time. I've got uh, a a 2,500 yard swim, but I'm going to do a five minute warm up, and then I'm going to jump into the main set, focus on the intent of the main set. And maybe I'm going to skip the cool down and I get out with maybe uh, 2000 yards and which is a great workout. 2000 yards is great. And you hit the intent. And so maybe the box isn't exactly green, but you know, you've, you've had a success success at that, that pool. And I think this actually bleeds nicely into another mistake that we see, which is kind of some level of inflexibility with training. So feeling like if I don't hit every single green box and the world is going to end, and I think that mindset can breed a lot of anxiety when things just inevitably don't go according to plan. You show up and the pool is closed for cleaning, but you had to get your swim in that day or your car broke down or you have a niggle and you don't ignore it. I think we say that it's really important to try to hit like maybe 80 to 90 percent of your scheduled workouts. But it's really important to be OK with the occasional yellow, orange or even red box and embrace it and also just learn how to listen to your body. Um, this is related to our point on just using too much data and not listening. And then finally, it's really important for avoiding burnout because I find that someone who is so perfectionist and type A about if I don't hit every single workout, this whole plan is going to go to shit. That is a great way to just not make the sport sustainable. And we'll probably have a whole episode on just in general how you make sport sustainable over years and years and even over a lifetime. But that inflexibility is um, definitely an issue in the beginning. Yeah, and I think this brings back something we talked about before is this, you know, sort of these exercise snacks. If you if you have, um, I was talking to an athlete this morning and just having a hard time maybe always getting it a full hour Monday through Friday to because it's super busy. And so I said, well, let's focus on exercise snacks. So let's just do, you know, if, if you're calling for an, an hour run, for example, and you can get out for a 20 or 30 minute run, like that's perfect. And those 20 to 30 minute runs will really stack up over time. And there's a lot of power in that. So yeah, you're not necessarily doing the, the quote, the workout, but you really are doing the, the work. And, uh, and then maybe you can, you know, focus on something longer in the weekend, but yeah, just, you know, modify, modify. And, uh, again, reach out to your coach if you're having a problem with, you know, maybe hitting your workouts. And again, we don't expect people to be hitting all green boxes. And I worry about people who just do all green boxes because I know that then they're rearranging their life, completely rearranging their life to hit all the workouts. And as you mentioned it, that may not be sustainable in the long run. Uh, next one here. I like this one that you wrote, Jim, focusing on process over outcomes. What do you think about that? Yeah. So we're sort of the same themes, like focus on the day-to-day consistency. And something that Dr. Justin Ross uh, in his interview mentioned this thing called performance standards. And performance standards are really things that you control. So example of a performance standards are uh, quality of mind, which is, uh, in other words, uh, developing a positive mindset and, and mantras. We've, we've talked about that before and developing these sort of effort level based uh, standards. So giving your best effort, even when you maybe you're falling off the pace. And then also just sort of controlling for like just having a, a, a positive mindset. So yeah, focus on the, the process and not, not always the outcomes. Yeah. And the mistake that we see here pretty commonly is people coming in with only outcome based goals. And then if you don't hit them, it's a much harder fall. I would say if like your only goal is I want to run sub four, I want to be Q or I want to qualify for Kona, whatever that is, it's really hard if that doesn't work out. So I think having some process goals at the outset is a way to kind of ward against like not every race is going to go perfectly. So keeping that in mind. Yeah, that, that performance-based identity is really hard. And I think it's all related to to perfectionism and perfectionism being this very fragile state. So again, we've, you know, we've talked about this before in other, in other episodes. So again, it's our job to help you guys, you know, identify that if we see that in our athletes and help you guys work through that and see sort of some other ways to reach your goals that maybe aren't so soul crushing if you don't get to them. I feel like we need a whole episode called like the recovering perfectionist or something because yes. that's like, it's very related to our population. I think it's very related to our population, our type AAA. Yeah. And the thing is, you know, a lot of the athletes that we work with, they're highly successful people and hard work and grinding has got them to where they are today. They're successful because of all that. But sometimes it is funny with sports is that you sometimes have to sort of set that model aside because that same grinding, yeah, will serve you, but it's more like consistency and intent. And I don't know, they just, I, I haven't quite flushed it all out yet, but that model of what got you to where you are professionally may not always work within the context of your sport. 
I think if we have an episode also on burnout, like that will be related. So stay tuned, folks, because if this resonates, it resonates for us too. Yes. Um, okay, a couple more mistakes here. We're going to fire off four to close out that are all related to racing. So first one that I wanted to call out is often we see people make the mistake of either racing way too much or racing way too little. So racing way too much, if you're the type of person who's going to sign up for a race every single weekend of the summer, you end up kind of in this chronic state of high cortisol, fight or flight. It will probably lead to some overtraining because the level to which you push in a race is exceeding 80-20, even if you're doing all easy stuff otherwise. And it makes it hard to focus on things like aerobic base building because all you are doing is racing and recovering. But on the flip side, I would say racing too little makes it really hard to develop the skills that you need on race day. And I would say it leads to a lot of extra pre-race anxiety if you put all of your eggs in a single racing basket. So you want to figure out what that sweet spot is for any given season. And that's something you should think about at the beginning of the season is what's a realistic number of races for me to do? Those considerations will be really different based on whether you're a runner or you're doing sprints versus Ironmans or Olympics. But I guess the question for you, Jim, is how much racing do you think makes sense from just a general season planning perspective to hit that sweet spot? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I think it's individual, but you're right. You know, the, I always say racing is such a r- rich learning environment and we learn so many conscious and unconscious things when we go to a race. And that race could just be your, like your local 5K, uh, but you'll learn so much for it. And we typically, what we say is we try to, you know, for our bigger races, maybe half Ironman, Ironman races, we try to reserve that last 12 weeks for mostly just training for that specific event and any sort of racing done within that window tends to set us back or just recovering from, say, we want to run a half marathon eight weeks out from your Ironman is really tough because then we have to sort of taper into your half marathon and then give you a couple weeks to recover. And suddenly you've lost a third of your specific prep time. But, you know, if you are doing a long distance athlete, you can throw some sprints and Olympics in there. And like you say, Katie, it's really valuable to learn those skills. So it's this real balancing act. And I do think that in general, most triathletes don't race enough. Um, I do have some athletes who race a lot. But yeah, don't be afraid to sort of get into the scrum and and, uh, sign up for a few things and you'll learn a ton about racing and about triathlon, you know, for yourself and you'll see other people doing the sport too. And you can learn a lot that way just by watching what other people are are doing at these big events. When you see hundreds of people doing the same thing you're doing, you're bound to pick up a lot of different things. I agree with that completely. It reminds me a little bit of just, you know, thinking about this season for me, my A race is Sea to Summit in July, but I am racing a sprint triathlon at the end of June, not because I really care about the sprint triathlon distance, but because I need to not put all of my eggs in this one basket. I need to get some of that race energy out. And it's not an A race. It's there for fun. Um, it's a family event, but I think it is going to help me a lot just for the mindset prep of going into a race day. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Um, The next one here, we think it's common to make the mistake of signing up for races that aren't necessarily appropriate for your experience or fitness level. So Jim, why don't you take that one? Yeah, sure. I get a lot of folks who show up and say, hey, I signed up for an Ironman and it's six months from now. I'm like, hey, have you ever done a triathlon before? Like, no, it's my first triathlon ever. And again, sometimes like Coach Kevin, that works out quite well, but in most cases it really doesn't. So we really try to encourage folks is to sign up for races that are appropriate for your level. And so if you are just starting a triathlon journey, yeah, it's been the first one or two seasons, you know, focusing on sprints and Olympics and kind of, yeah, learning the craft, learning, you know, the gear and learning the pacing and all that. And then we can start thinking about, okay, what about half Ironmans? Because half Ironmans a, a big deal as well too. And then Ironman, of course, the, the big one. So yeah, just try to, you know, think about the sport in terms of many, many, many years, as opposed to just going to like going big right from the very outset. Because oftentimes I think that, you know, some people are, are happy with their just doing, you know, a one and done for maybe an Ironman. But most folks I think we work with are kind of interested in like having a longer term, healthy lifestyle, healthy body, strong body. And Ironman may or may not fit, you know, their lifestyle at this point. Yeah. And I think we can actually look at how most professionals approach Ironman. If you look at the Ironman pro class, there are very few athletes there who started with Ironman. A lot of them were on the ITU circuit, for example, or going to the Olympics really fast. We can look at, you know, we know Sarah True pretty well, and she crushed at ITU for many, many, many years. And then it wasn't that big of a deal to just bridge volume to a longer distance. And then she crushed at the Ironman distance later. But if you're just a, a regular person like you and me are, Jim, I think it also makes sense to follow that trajectory of start with the shorter, shorter races. And this actually, this brings up a quick story that I wanted to share this past week at the New England season opener. I had an athlete come to me, I think in November, looking for a coach to do her very first triathlon ever. And she had no experience even really running. And so we started from a run-walk program to figure out what it was like to run, to get comfortable on the bike, to get comfortable with swimming. 
And she absolutely crushed it at the New England season opener the other day. She did something she absolutely would not have been able to do way back in November. And now she signed up for an Olympic in August. And that's awesome. And that's a trajectory that we love to see, even if you know how to run, even if you're a pretty good biker and a swimmer. I say totally agree with starting small. Um, If you're signed up for your first race in a Ironman, that's okay. We will still get you there. But if you're a blank slate, I would say uh, start, start small is a good way to go. Right, exactly. I had another athlete actually sign up again this week as well, too. And same thing, like, I'm thinking about never done a triathlon. I'm going to do a sprint in September. I'm like, oh, this is great. We're going to get along really well. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And I think the point here, too, is like that is something that you can do. It's so smart to get a coach when you're just starting that journey because so many people kind of do those first years on their own or they figure it out. And I've heard so many stories of athletes who are like, yeah, I had a start and stop year. I was injured, this and that. Like if you're starting your journey, get a coach right now. We're here for that. And it doesn't mean that you have to be doing an Ironman or an elite athlete to have a coach. I think it's even more valuable at the very beginning. Yeah. And this one's sort of related to racing and TT bikes. And so some of our athletes have TT bikes, other people don't. But if you do have a TT bike, um, please, please, please start using your TT bike, you know, within that 12 weeks from your A race. And I've had athletes who have surprised me in the past and then said, oh yeah, you know, three weeks out from the race going, should I get on my TT bike? And I'm like, oh no, I just assumed you've been on your TT bike the whole entire time. And like, no, I didn't, haven't been on my TT bike yet this season. So yes, you know, in the fall, in the winter, yeah, ride your road bike and even in the springtime, but even that sort of that magic 12 weeks is, is really switch over whatever bike you're going to use for the race races. Maybe it is your road bike and you've been on a Peloton, but get on the bike that you're going to be using for your race and don't save it for the last couple of weeks and do your last bricks on the TT bike or whatever bike you're going to race on. Jim, I have to say, I really commend you for giving that insight because I expected it might be a little bit triggering to talking about getting getting on your TT bike right before your race. <laughs> but you crushed it. You absolutely yeah, crushed it. Exactly right. Actually, scratch all that. Do not get on your TT bike anywhere near <laughs> your race day at all. Like, right? Sell your TT stay, bike. <laughs> stay home. Get on. Everybody should get a Zwift membership and put your bike on the back <laughs> on the trainer. Yes, exactly. <laughs> awesome. All right. And our very last mistake um, that we want to talk about here is related to pacing. So it's important to be really disciplined during training and especially during a race because once you're tapered or in general, you will find that watts come really, really easy in the beginning. So a mistake that we see people making is going too hard, too fast in the beginning and then really blowing up the end. So with both training and racing, you have to be patient. Um, Avoid the urge to just go for it because you feel so good. Yeah, this goes back to you were talking about fatigue, acute fatigue and chronic fatigue. And and so whether you're doing a sprint or Olympic or half or Ironman, like we're going to taper you guys into your race and you probably haven't had that kind of level of energy for a very long time. And so it's so easy to come off that taper and get on your bike and you think, this is race day magic. My watts are like, I'm up 10% today. <laughs> and you realize, no, no, you're just really, really, really rested. And so be thankful if you start your race and the watts and the effort are coming really easy because they probably won't later on in the race. So just so just be aware that, okay, this is just, I'm super rested and hold back, hold back, hold back. I will need that energy you know, later on in the race. I love it. Okay. Well, that was a big grab bag of random mistakes. Hopefully, if you avoid making these mistakes, you will be better off than we were for many, many years. But I have to say, you know, we're still learning all the time. And so we can probably have a second installment of mistakes even six months from now and say a bunch of things that we were doing right now that we thought were amazing and actually aren't. So it's a learning process, but it's fun to learn. And I think, yeah, I mean, really, I think our coaching insights, what we do every week is really just stuff that we're learning, right? It's maybe not a mistake per se, but I think that's exactly what we're we're saying is you and I both, we use this podcast to learn from each other and learn from our community. So yeah, we're constantly making mistakes, learning new things or relearning new things and allowing us to sort of verbalize that, pass it on to you guys. And uh, for us to remind each other like, oh yeah, that's something that we need to keep in mind and relearn or, or learn again. So yeah. And just as a message to our athletes, we reserve the right to change our minds about things, about training philosophies, about the right things to go. So oh, of course. if we're yes, doing yes. all this stuff right now in a year, we might be like, OK, tempo running, zero, never doing that again. We'd love to be wrong, too. Yes. Yeah, we could be wrong. We're going to be wrong a lot. So, yes, for sure. We anticipate it. OK. All right. <laughs> let's jump in. We have great listener questions this week, so I want to make sure we had time for this. So let's fire off the ones that we got. Um, the very first one is why don't we program specific strength workouts week to week for our athletes? So I guess my answer on this is that strength is something that's really, really individualized. And ideally, a strength program is going to work on your personal imbalances and limiters. So maybe you have an unstable pelvis and you really need to work that right side. Or maybe your 
back is really weak or things like that. And at the end of the day, we're mostly remote coaches and we're not physical therapists or strength trainers. So we don't really know what those are. There's also a lot of really big variation in exposure and ability when it comes to strength training. So some people have a background in powerlifting and they know exactly what they need to do in the gym. Other people have never stepped foot in the gym before in their lives. And so that would just be a big, I guess, lift for us as coaches to meet you exactly where that is. But we do have some things that can help you. So we do drop in some suggested exercises that tend to work out for a lot of athletes. And we 100% recommend working with a strength trainer if you feel like you need more of that guidance or the gym is totally foreign to you. And then last principle here is, as a general principle, it's good to focus on areas that tend to get neglected for triathletes. So think about a strong core. Think about that side-to-side motion. Things like the glute medius get really neglected. Some level of plyometric work. But yeah, I think it's a good question. And at this point, unless we get strength trainer certified, probably we'll keep doing what we're doing. But we always welcome more resources from our community to share with people. Yeah, absolutely. I think the strength trainer really fits into that in the same category, sort of a physical therapist, which is like, you need a professional to really help you, you know, to design a program that's very specific to you. So like you say, we'll suggest stuff on here, but we're not trying to be a strength trainer. We never are going to be strength trainers. But uh, if you're just new to strength training, yeah, go hire a professional. And there's lots of strength, great strength trainers out there and they'll get you on the right track. Mm-hmm. And to make it affordable, like some people even do like a strength class. That's an option, a little bit better than having like a one-on-one personal trainer. And then similarly, again, get someone for two or three sessions and then you can just learn. Third thing I'll say, too, is that sometimes if you hate strength, working with a trainer can make it really, really fun. I have totally flip-flopped from like strength is the thing I look forward to the most almost now as compared to in the past when I was like, I hate everything about it. So don't assume that you will hate it forever. Maybe just finding the right person can be really helpful there. Perfect. Next question. I love this question so much. Someone dropped in our form the question, what makes an athlete coachable? So how can you improve kind of that coach-athlete relationship so it's beneficial for both parties? Jim, what are your thoughts on that question? Yeah, well, I like communication and attitude were really the two things that came up. And so as remote coaches, it's really challenging because we're not there on a day-to-day basis to, to, you know, to see you move and just to sort of get it into general temperature of how the athlete's doing. So that communication is super important, even if it's just short communication and, and training peaks. So that for me is a coach is a really important thing. And I think the other thing too is just that attitude of like, you know, every day doesn't have to be sunny and, and roses, but just that showing up and being ready to, again, sort of back to the intent, like I'm intending today to make my best effort at this workout. And maybe the workout doesn't, doesn't go great. That's okay too, but you've intended, you have the good attitude to bring forth and just showing up and communicating is just, a, I think the two biggest attributes that really help me relate to my athletes. And I feel like that my best athletes have both those qualities and have longevity in the sport and we work well together and it, it's just very enjoyable. And often those folks tend to reach their goals more than almost anybody else. I completely agree with that. Yeah. I think I wrote down communication and transparency as two of the very most important. And I think sometimes people worry, they're like, oh, I don't want to bother them. Like I know my coaches are busy. I know they have a lot of athletes, but I have actually never had someone who I'm like, wow, they communicate with me way too much. Training Peaks is there. Again, it's not like people are calling me on the phone every hour of the day, but Training Peaks is there. We have control over, you know, when we jump in and give you comments back. And the more detail I can get, the better. If someone's race sim rolls in and they rode for five hours and I don't get a single comment, it's like, what? Like, what's going on here? And I feel like I'm coming in with like, how did it feel? How is your feeling? How's your mindset? All those things. So if you can get on top of that, that's really helpful to us. And one more trait that I'll add that I think is really valuable here is some level of open-mindedness. I don't actually think that it's good if an athlete is going to blindly follow everything the coach does with ever, ever asking questions or kind of asking about the intention of a workout. But some level of open-mindedness to trying new things, it can sometimes be hard when you start working with an athlete who's like, no, I have it all figured out. Then you don't really know why they hired you as a coach if they have it all figured out. But willingness to say like, yeah, I'm not really sure. I'm nervous about this, but I'm going to give it a try. I think is it goes along with your attitude piece is so, so valuable for athletes. Yeah, it is. It is. I think maybe one of the common mistakes back to that is that, yeah, some folks do hire us and they say, I've kind of got a lot of things figured out and I'm going to do my own thing. And you're like, well, why did you hire us as a, as a coach? And uh, again, there's a real pattern here is, is those folks tend to be the ones who don't seem to reach their goals as well as maybe some other folks who are open-minded to this and say, yeah, I'm willing to try some new things. And yeah, it is a leap of faith to hire a coach and place all this trust because we're using so much of your time, right? And so, yeah, I, I love that, you know, being open-minded, I think is a trait of a high performer. Okay. Another question here, I'm going to read this because it's a little bit of a long question, but it's a very good one. It says, As an athlete, I like to set relatively competitive goals for myself when it comes to races, like running under a certain time, placing my age group, getting a podium finish, etc. 
This places a certain amount of stress on me mentally, and I've learned to love it. I let it drive me to be consistent with my workouts and push me on days when I'm feeling lazy. However, as a coach, when an athlete approaches you with competitive goals, do you feel a certain stress? How do you handle it? Does it get worse around race day, similar to an athlete's stress? And have you ever turned an athlete away if their goals would cause you too much stress? So this is a really great question, and I think it's really common for athletes to have really, really big outcome goals like this. I think for me as a coach, I don't take a ton of that stress on because my focus is always so much around these process goals. And I actually have a lot of process goals for myself as your coach. Not I want my athlete to PR, but I want to deliver flexible, individualized, dynamic training plans on time, reliably. I want to communicate clearly. I want to show empathy. All of these things that are really consistent with my coaching values. I would say that I do still get some level of race day stress, you know, around uncontrollables, just like athletes maybe do. So as soon as people get out of the water and their swim was safe, I'm like, thank gosh, I'm so happy. Or when there are no bike crashes, I'm really happy about that. And when scary things happen or disappointing things happen, I do really feel for my athletes because I think a coach is someone who knows probably the most intimately what went into that preparation. But that coach is also someone who can provide support. So I know I have a really important role to play here. And I would say I have never turned away an athlete because they have big outcome goals. I'm like, let's do it. Big goals. But I'm going to push you hard to kind of focus on the process instead. I, yeah, I agree with everything you say. So sort of plus one on that. I think I, I would add that, you know, we have some athletes who come to us and they say, I have these really big goals. And again, we support you. We want to have these big goals. And there should be a certain amount of goals that you should fail. Like I think of goals almost like the workouts, like one third should be terrible. One third, you should be fine. And one third, be like, I was amazing. And so you should set some goals, that big goals that you're not going to hit. And that's okay. We should be like, that means you're pushing yourself. You're pushing yourself to the edge and we'll eventually get there, but maybe we don't get to the first time. But, you know, I guess maybe some pressure I feel sometimes is folks say, hey, I need you to you know, help me find another two miles an hour per hour on the bike, for example. And I'll say, okay, well, here, you know, here's some of the best practices. Here's, you know, what we can do to, to get there. And I'll have athletes who, you know, who come back again and again. I need you to, you know, help me do this and help me do that. And so as a coach, I'm like, okay, I need to set up the appropriate workouts and or make the appropriate gear recommendations for you to reach those goals. But then sort of like it's on you as well, too. And so I know I'm going back to some of those athletes a lot and saying, okay, I think I've done my part, but are you, you know, but you're missing workouts. So you've held me accountable and I hear that and I should because that's my job, but I'm now coming back to you and saying, I'm holding you accountable as well, too. And those can be kind of tough conversations. And, you know, it's funny because this is a great question and thinking back on a lot of athletes that we've coached and I've, again, sort of a common characteristic of sort of our high performers is that they come out and they say, these are my goals. And we talk about their goals, but then often they just kind of quietly go ahead and just focus on the process and they quietly work away at it without really sort of spending a lot more time focusing on the outcome goal. Like we've talked about that. We know what we're aiming for. We're both bought in on that, but there's a lot more talk about process and about craft and about skill building than there really is about the outcome and the actual race or the PR or whatever it is. And so for me, there's a little bit of a red flag sometimes when I've got athletes who want to constantly focus on like a specific time or a specific FTP or a specific this. I just worry because sometimes I think that energy couldn't be spent really focusing more on like, hey, how do we get there? Because it's really all about how we get there. It's, you know, the results and your PR and your FTP, that's so far downstream from everything. We need to focus on everything upstream to get you to that place. Yeah. And this brings us back actually to a mistake that we talked about earlier. I don't think it's a mistake to have outcome goals, but only focus on them as maybe more of that mistake. So as coaches and athletes, we can work together on kind of grounding in that process. All right. Last question here. We had a lot of notes on this, but we're going to try to expedite it a little bit. How do I use my power meter while racing on the bike? So this is triathlon specific. Jim, why don't you take this one? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think the sort of the setup here is that, you know, we, we spend, you know, all winter on Zwift and we're focusing on very specific, you know, percents of FTP and it gives us sort of this sort of sense of control. And then when we go outside, it's something like, oh, there's heat and there's humidity and there's hills and there's tailwind and crosswinds and frontwinds. And so suddenly your world has become so much more complex when you go outside and, and ride a bike. And so we talk about things like, you know, paying attention to heart rate, pay attention to miles per hour, and also paying attention to watts. And people go, well, wait a minute, we were just focused on watts for the last six months. You're like, yeah, we still should be focusing on watts, but make it a target, make it a range, right? So, you know, plus or minus 5% of your target. So if you're trying to, 
you know, aim at the 170 normalized power for say an Ironman. So that's anywhere from maybe the 160 to 180 range, you know, um, and the goal of training and for race sims is to practice that, get that feel for what does that really feel like? What does that easy pace feel like? Or if it's an Olympic, what does my threshold pace really feel like? And then have stuff, you know, have the data on your bike computer and, you know, check it every once in a while and say, oh yeah, yeah, I, you know, my level of effort and my heart rate and everything, you know, lines up with my watts, but give yourself that range and sort of just recognize that there's so much more going on out there than just a specific number on a bike computer. Totally agree with that. And it actually reminds me of a conversation that I had with one of my athletes who raced this past weekend. And we were talking about his race plan for just a sprint triathlon. And he said, all right, on the bike, are we going by power, heart rate, or vibes? And I said, actually, I think it's mostly vibes. We're going to use a little bit of heart rate. We're going to use a little bit of power. But at the end of the day, like vibes kind of wins in some of these cases. And yep. training a lot is what gives you the feel for what the vibes are. You can't go in blind. You have to have understood those vibes. But I think overall feeling is really powerful here. So, yeah, I appreciate that question a lot. All right. We nailed those listener questions. Last two finishing segments here. Number one, challenge of the week. So... I'm going to challenge people to try to do at least three to five minutes every day of a little bit of breath work. So things like box breathing, I can link what some of these are, things like a double inhale with a big exhale. I have found that that helps me so much, especially if I'm feeling like a little overwhelmed or a little scattered. Breath work is absolutely huge. And it's something that you can also really try right before a race is huge or before a race sim or just if you're really feeling that that sort of mental or physical overwhelm, try some breath work would be my recommendation. Yeah. Awesome. And my challenge of the week is as it is race season. So this is a really good time to maybe check in with your primary support peeps and just say, Hey, you know, thanks for, thanks for supporting me. And, uh, you know, race season is here and things are kind of hectic and just check in with them, see how they're doing. And maybe there's something that you can, you can do for them. I love that. Okay. Gear Pink of the Week, our very favorite segment ever. Um, I am going to recommend a bike bag. So if you've ever flown anywhere with a bike, there's a lot of different ways to do it. But a few years ago, I invested in a Cycon, I think is how you say the, na the name of this brand, S-C-I-C-O-N bike bag for travel. It is a soft shell bike bag, but it's really awesome because the only thing you have to take apart is just take the wheels off. You don't have to take your handlebars apart. And if you are not savvy when it comes to bike mechanic things like I am, I can definitely take my wheels off. And so far, it's worked really, really well. I would say that it is not the very safest, like a hard shell case is going to be better if TSA decides to slam your bike on the ground. But I've traveled with my bike a lot and so far have not really had any big issues. So if you're looking for something that makes it easy to fly your bike places, you should check this out. And a lot of airlines now don't actually even charge extra for you just pay for a check bag with a bag like this. So highly recommend the Cycon bike bag. Yeah, as someone who owns a lot of different bike bags, I think, Katie, yeah, your bike bag you have, is it's really great. It's it's really fast and very secure. And that's a great gear pick of the week. And my gear pick of the week, is speaking of swimming, is this Aquasphere Cayenne swim goggles. And I use them for open water, but for many years, I also use them in the pool. They're very sort of silicon based and very, very comfortable around your eyes. And so anyway, it's open water season. So check those out. Can I ask you a question, actually? A listener question from me. Do you need yeah. different goggles for open water swimming versus pool swimming? Oh, so yeah. So for, for many years, I used the Aquasphere Cayenne in the in the pool as well. But then I then I succumbed to peer pressure and I bought some actual arena swim goggles that made me look cool in the pool, or I tried to look cool in the pool anyway. So, uh, but yeah, I would say for these, I would just buy a pair. I've I don't know, had you know ten fifteen pairs of these, and just again, you use them in the pool, use them in the, in the open water as well. So, uh, what what are you using? Are you using different ones in the pool than the outdoor? Yeah. So I actually use the same goggles inside and outside. I have a mirrored pair and then I have a clear pair, which is helpful if it's cloudy or something, but I should definitely check these out. I will say for whatever reason, I feel like my eyes or face are like a little bit of a weird shape. And so kids goggles actually fit me better. So I have a speedo pair of kids goggles that I found in the Lawson and found at the Stanford pool like six years ago. And they're great. So my gear pick of the week is the Stanford pool loss and found for some kids swim goggles for sure. Some poor kids walking around. I lost my goggles, mom. <laughs> Katie's I'm like, really the best goggles ever. <laughs> sorry, kid. <laughs> the chat's out of the bag. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Well, that's my secret. New, new segment, secret of the week. Right. Right. Um, secret gear week. But anyway, I think that brings us to the end. Thank you, everyone, for listening. We will be back next week. This was a fun episode, and we may have a special guest joining us in the next couple of weeks who's been on the podcast before. So stay tuned for that. And yeah, thanks so much for listening. Yeah, thanks, peeps. Mm -hmm.